<laughs> Dr. Gareth Morgan, good morning. Thank you for joining us. No trouble. Nice to talk to you. You look like you're sitting in a beautiful room, a beautiful, cosy uh, wood room with uh, a nice fire beside you. You up in Pahitua, north of Wellington? No, I'm in Wellington. I'm in Oriental Bay. Oh, okay. In the oh. I, I thought you were a bit north there. That's where the, the golf course is, a little bit further north. Oh, yeah. Up at, um, yeah, Bawa Tūnui. Oh, nice. And um, how has life been for you over the last couple of months, personally, with the coronavirus lockdown and all that sort of thing? What's been happening in the Morgan oh, household? We've really liked it. Joanne and I have been locked up. We've got um, grandchildren in this area, so, you know, we haven't been completely isolated. We were able to go to their house and sort of sit in the driveway and talk to them through the window. Yeah. But our main, our main activity was just soaping around the city, and the only thing that passed me on Lampton Key was uh, tumbleweed. Right. During those. Unbelievable. Yeah, I had um, I had Grant Fox on a couple of days ago, and he said a similar thing. He had his, he's got grandkids within walking distance of his house, and he was like, I quite liked it. It felt a little bit like retirement, and I quite liked it for him. So yeah. I yeah, get it. Quite awesome. Hey, um, you've had your finger in uh, many pies in New Zealand society. I mean, obviously, a lot of people think about you around, uh, you know, hedge funds or uh, economics in particular, but also in the political spectrum as well. So I just thought you'd be an amazing person to talk to about, you know, um, uh, to do with COVID in particular, but obviously to do with where we are in a election cycle. Um, you've got uh, the economy at the moment, what's happening with it, the response politically and where we are as a nation with COVID. You got any thoughts around that and, and how we're doing and how we've done? Well, obviously, um, we've done pretty well, or the government has. I mean, you can chip around the edges, as I sort of did publicly. I mean, they're a bit slow, I thought, to bring in Level 4 and especially to shut the border, very slow. But once they got there, um, you know, it was... In terms of judging against their peer group internationally, they were actually quite quick mm. um, compared to overseas. And they probably held uh, level four about 10 days too long, which might seem trivial to a lot of people, but every day every day you delay, that's another, you know, how many businesses that actually end up, will end up going to the wall because it's cash flow. So it's not a costless it's not a costless process. So I think they should have come to level three a bit earlier. Yep. But, you know, that sort of stuff is chipping around the edges, really. I mean, you've got to judge it overall. And I think overall they've done really well. Their biggest um, Achilles heel was right from the start was the border. And as we've seen in the last couple of days, it's still the blooming border. Um, they really are struggling yeah. to, you know, isolate us and protect us. Um, so hopefully, you know, the attention that's now got, hopefully there's a silver lining to this. And, you know, they put a lot more resource into closing that border or at least, you know, policing that border properly. And so that when people come across it, they can come across it, but there are protocols that must be obeyed. I think if they can get their, you know, act together on that, um, they'll be back to sort of pretty well up there in the world leading group along with Taiwan and South Korea and, you know, a couple of others. Yeah, it seems that the, the third case of COVID that we were told about, um, I think yesterday, that seems to be the way that they've tried to make it work because that person was at the border but still in the isolation facility. And that uh, yeah. when more COVID comes, that's how we want it to come. When you've come into yeah. the border but you're still right. under isolation as opposed to, you know, travelling 750 k's to go to a funeral. That's not, not necessarily well, the best way. Well, I think everybody probably in the high, higher echelons of government was astounded that people could come out of isolation without being tested. I mean, yeah. That's, that's a mind blow, really. You, uh, that was a big hop. You've been someone, obviously, the head of a political party, um, a founder of a political party, but also obviously head of industry and business as well. What, what do you think about where the buck stops? Um, like we see Todd Muller at the moment kind of throwing a lot of dirt towards uh, David Clark, kind of holding him personally responsible for someone, f for an obvious failure in the system that happened in an Ellerslie hotel. What do you think is a fair amount of responsibility to put at that person at the very top versus what's the amount of uh, grace we should give them because there's always going to be things that fall over in the process? Yeah, and I think that's a fair point. I mean, as long as, you know, the ministry isn't a, re uh, re a repeat offender in terms of, you know, doing it on and on and on, 
I think that the stones the opposition throw, they throw because, you know, they're an opposition and under <laughs> our adversarial, um, you know, two-party system, that's, you know, the only traction they can get in the media. But um, to me, you've got to take it very much with a grain of salt. Um, I think the issue really has been that down at that border, I mean, and in the quarantine and all that, it's been policed by, you know, security guards and people yeah. who really are just nowhere near qualified enough. Um, so we haven't put the resource into protecting ourselves. Now, okay, that's been shown. And, you know, we've had the two or three cases. So as long as we respond to that and, you know, improve the act, then I think that's where it stops, move on. The opposition quite clearly will milk as much as they can um, from it. But, you know, I think to ordinary people, they look a bit um, sort of childish um, if they go on too long about it. It's, it's an element, surely, in politics as well of having to read the room. And I think we saw uh, Simon Bridges not reading the room correctly uh, with that infamous Facebook uh, post where maybe he was criticising a bit too early when the nation was in love with the current result. And I guess the, 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 the polls will tell us, or the election will tell us, whether Mueller and his team are reading the room right now with some of this criticism they're putting out there, or will the country back, will that backfire and the country go, actually, we're pretty happy. And that's to come, I guess. Yeah, no, that is to come. I mean, they'd be um, negligent if they didn't, you know, bang a drum a little. But as you say, it's a judgment call in the end, which Bridge has got terribly well. Yeah, he did. Um, so hopefully Muller's a wee bit, um, you know, more mature. I, um, you, you've kind of said it similar to what I've been saying, because I, what I did during the lockdown was about 30 podcasts because everyone was home. So I had a great yeah. amount of time speaking to all sorts of interesting people all over the world. Um, but the one of the... the common things I was saying, and, and you have reiterated probably uh, more succinctly than I about around chipping around the edges, is imagining that there's two columns of decisions, you know, one is the good decision column, one is the bad decision column, acknowledging we're never going to get it perfectly right, we want to make as many decisions out of the good column and as few out of the bad column, and maybe maybe the, you know, getting into level four too slow and coming out too, uh, by both of them too slow, coming out too slow, would be the decisions from level four, uh, some people would say, but all, all in all, I'm very thankful for where we're at right now that, you know, the Highlanders had a great game in the weekend and the Blues had a great game and people were able to get out and do things. And, and I, in fact, I turned on, I freaked out a little bit. I, 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 I ingest American politics almost intravenously. I love it. And I turned on the news yesterday and I saw, it might have been Mike Pence, it doesn't really matter who it was, but the two politicians behind him wrapped up with masks on. And I just thought, oh, that's right, the rest of the world is still going through this. And it was a bit of a shock, actually, because I'd become sort of complacent and comfortable with my no masks and no you know, rubber gloves already. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, America is has really decided, having failed at the uh, lockdown-type strategy, has decided belatedly that it will now switch officially to the Swedish strategy yeah. of, you know, immunisation, which, of course, there's no evidence yet that that actually works at all, or if it does, it, you know, works any more than a couple of weeks. So it's an extremely high-risk strategy, and I saw last night, I mean, I'm a bit like you on the US politics, it's the first thing I look at in the yeah. morning. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, 3,000 cases in Florida alone last night, new cases. So, boy, they're steaming. And actually, when you look at the American curve now, even including New York, it is turning up into the second coming. Um, excluding New York, it's been doing that for a while. But um, all, overall, Amer I think America's got big problems, actually. I do too. A lot of those evangelical Americans would like to hear the term the second coming has come into America, but I don't think of the sense that you mean it. I think in a completely no. different sense altogether. <laughs> the thing about the Swedish model is the difference though is Sweden kind of said we are doing this, you know, the whole herd immunity, whereas America is pretending it's not happening. Well, Trump is in his administration and they're going to try and attain herd immunity, but there's a different approach. You know, one was an active decision to try it. The other is kind of let's ignore this and see if we can do it. And and you'll know this better than me being you know an economist, as my understanding is the economy didn't really get any benefit from that herd, herd immunity in Sweden. It still suffered the same sort of GDP drop that its neighbouring countries did who, who did it a different way, but just with a lot more dead people. Yeah, well, it showed a very interesting aspect of human behaviour, actually, because 
um, despite the fact that their government was encouraging them to st keep going to the cafes and doing all the social um, contact, people actually took the law into their own hands or their behaviour into their own hands and stopped doing it. So when you look at the retail trade figures for Sweden, for example, they didn't um, hold up any more than they'd already, you know, than they fell yeah. in Denmark and Norway and, and Finland and so on. So, pe so they actually got the same sort of um, isolation effect by default in spite of the government. Yeah, so they got the same isolation effect to their economy but with an exponential number, uh, exponential more number of people dying. So it seemed to be a failed yeah. experiment to me. Yeah, no, the, oh, I think it was very failed. And, and they've obviously belatedly now trying to play catch up. Yeah. Um, you know, and, 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 I mean, the UK is not much better, actually, um, which, of course, is where our latest two cases or two of the three have come from. So, yeah, you're right. We're an island and we're surrounded by evil. Yeah. Uh, right <laughs> I've been saying we are an island unto ourselves, both metaphorically and literally. Hopefully, we'll be able to stay that way. Look, I, th I think that we've always, no one has said we are going to have zero cases because they are going to come in from the border. But as a, as a citizen and a, a so called team of five million that we've been, you know, keep getting told about how well we've done, I just hope now that those uh, decisions outside my control, like I could control locking down. I could control, you know, uh, not going out. I could control washing my hands. Like all the things that I could do, I did. And I feel like I've made a contract with you now, you know, government, that I've done my part. Now you need to do your part, which is the, the border issues, because that's really the only thing that we need to now make sure that we've done. And because we've done our part as citizens, please, let's get this right. Let's hope that these two people driving to um, Wellington is is... You know, like when the All Blacks have a close game and they get a bit of a fright, they don't quite lose, they have a close game, and then that G's them up and goes, okay, we better, we better reorganise ourselves for the next one. It's a bit like that. This is the close call. Let's hope it doesn't turn into a spike, but let's reorganise and, and get this right, which I think maybe they're doing. Um, it feels like they're doing. Yeah, I think also there's a relationship between the government and the public, you know, the so-called social licence, um, where the government, you know, did the lockdown, the four phases, and, you know, when it descended on us, we all went, right, but Jesus, you know, what the hell is ha happening here? Yeah. But we actually did participate and we did obey the law, yep. you know, and we did. And, and so the social take up was enormous from New Zealand. And then, of course, you got that whole string of days with no new cases and so on. And we were still in lockdown and, um, you know, a different form of lockdown. We were coming down to two. And people started, I don't know if you noticed, but people started disobeying it, especially young ones, you know, yep. they started, forget the social distancing, no, there's nothing to worry about, da 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 So what to me that meant was the, the government's policy at that time was starting to lose credibility. Right. In other words, being unnecessary. But notice how the public's attitude changed as soon as, as, soon as two cases got out of Auckland. I mean, the anger's just phenomenal mm. um, by New Zealand. Jesus, you know, you're supposed to protect us. So um, it seems to me that the government's got a, um, a strategy it must play. It's got to keep the public on board with whatever it's doing. So at the moment, the public is screaming for it to, you know, lock those borders tight so that people come through don't have it. And, you know, I would expect Jacinda and company to do that exactly because it's pretty embarrassing not to. But all I'm trying to say there is that this is a dynamic. And as we go through this covid era which i think will last you know two three years whatever it's going to take it's right. not going to be over the flesh you know there's going to be this touring and froing between the government and the license that you and i give the government to do what it does and that's going to take some pretty deft handling by the political leaders and to be fair jacinda is probably the best um politician out there that we've seen in this sort of crisis situation as a as a obviously a uh, person who was involved in politics and also, obviously who also you know, a lot of the work I would think of, a, of an economist uh, is affected by politics as well. Do you have any thoughts about this year's upcoming New Zealand election? Will it be the first time we have a majority government under MMP? What does your gut tell you? Yeah, I think that's quite possible. Um, absolutely. Um, all the workers ahead of Todd Muller and company. Um, and in a funny sort of way, it depends on where the um, virus goes um, between now and September, particularly overseas. So if, it, if that difference between New Zealand and the rest of the world gets even bigger, I mean, it's opening up now as the world's going into the second wave. Yeah. And hope 
in New Zealand has managed to snuff this out, then there's a big, there's a marked contrast between here and there, and that will that can only favour the government. Um, and so calls from the opposition to, you know, have the bubble with Australia to open the, the ports and all this sort of thing, they will just be received with um, widespread hostility. So I think um, Mueller's got to be very careful how he plays it between um, now and then. But, you know, COVID apart, I look at New Zealand politics and I see it very much as an establishment, um, very conservative scene. And I mean, the only reason I set top up, really, it was a bit of an epilogue to my working career, because right. I'd been in policy forever, was to take a whole lot of policy out there, throw it at the public, and it was good policy, you know, it was not not policy that I'd invented, it was, it was basically the consensus of best practice in many areas from policy advisors and, and analysts, and throw it at the New Zealand public and see if actually they were that interested in public and what we found uh, in policy. And what we found out was the answer is no. Um, and we saw that when Andrew um, Little, you know, bowed out to Jacinda, and over a period of 10 days, Labor's support went up um, 20%. Yeah, right. No reason at all, apart from it, there was no policy change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that that really struck me. And I thought, yeah, okay. Well, most of it's about personality, whatever, you know, the X factor. But very little of it's about policy. And I think, you know, the difference between the na national and labour on policy actually doing it is very, very small. I mean, as Tom Friedman, the New York columnist, came and said when he spoke in the town hall here many years ago, you know, both your parties will fit inside the Democrat Party in the US. You yep. know, there's that minor difference between them. You don't know what, you know, political difference is really. And so it comes down in the end to who do you like most, um, which is a funny way to run a country, but, you know, who am I to, who am I <laughs> to criticise it? Well, it's, it's, yeah, it is. I think you're right. And I remember when I was, you know, doing talkback on ZB, it was during the John Key years, the Helen Clark through the John Key years. And I, my opinion was always, we, we don't have a president in New Zealand, but, you know, as goes John, John Key, so goes national. If you like John Key, you vote national. If you like Helen Clark, you vote Labour. So I, I, I think, I think you're right. I think that's always sort of been the way it is. Um, and I think that, um, it's interesting that whilst policy doesn't matter, and COVID's an example of this, I think, there are still narratives you can push or that can be pushed in the public eye. For example, you know, Labor's about the worker, National's about the business. And then when this COVID thing happens and, you know, uh, the National's pushing for an earlier opening and Labor's, um, I guess, from your, what you said about getting open soon and dragging their heels a bit, that narrative can then get... Um, can get pushed further because people who support Labor can go, well, we're more about the workers in the business and people who support um, National are more about, well, we want the business owners to be able to open. So whilst they are quite close, and I always always say, talking to my American political friends, when I say, you know, our quote-unquote conservative, uh, our right-wing uh, prime minister voted for same-sex marriage, you watch their heads explode. You can see how close they are on so, many, on so, on, on so much policy. Yeah, so yeah, I, th I think that's right. Yeah, so, you know, for me, I mean, I was only in politics nine months. It felt like nine years, I say, <laughs> to you. But it was a sort of an epilogue, you know. You'd sort of done all this work on policy over the years, and you just came to the view, well, let's throw it out there and see what happens, you know. And after the nine months was up, that was enough. See you later. <laughs> did, you see, did you see any influence from the policy you were throwing out there being taken up by other parties, you know, often? A, oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it was certainly um, that policy has certainly come to the fore in several areas. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, the tax, the tax reform we had. Now, that was one of the options that, you know, Jacinda's um, tax review group looked at, you know, that Cullen headed. I mean, in the end, Jacinda's lot did absolutely nothing about tax. So, you know, that's a, that's a fail. Um, in terms of the housing crisis, we had a you know, a policy there that was fixing the rental, fixing the rental market, and making sure that the, the money I make from owning so many houses mm -hmm. is regarded as taxable income. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, um, that again overlapped with the tax, the tax um, committee um, work. But in the end, Labor decided they'd go with Kiwi Build, you know, as a way to 
face the crisis. And of course, we know what happened to that. That wasn't so good as well. And now we've got the marijuana, which was also a policy of tops in right. 2017. You know, what, it's not just about medicinal marijuana. It's about the harm that marijuana does and how do you bloody get that down. Right. The only way you can do that is by decriminalizing it. So what do you know? There's a, um, you know, there's a strategy on, on, on that. So I think in many areas, you know, where we were, we weren't that radical. Um, but it just came back to, you know, we were we were policy wonkers, really, Pat, and I think that that's <laughs> what... The appeal for that is um, quite limited. But it's nice, it's nice to think about... Um what you're doing kind of having an influence on what has happened as well. I mean, you do see it between the parties. Like I always remember, uh, you know, in the Helen Clark years, bringing in uh, working for families and interest-free student loans and the national government or national party at that stage being up in arms against it. But of course, because it was so popular, then they couldn't, wouldn't, didn't touch it. And we've still got those things to this day. So influence of whoever those policy writers were for Labour at those days have carried on for the next 20 years. So that's nice. Yeah, you get that leapfrogging between the two um, parties. You know, John Key's it. When John Key was in, the big policy with Bill Rhodes, you know, it'll make us all prosperous. Yep. Then Labor came in and, you know, with the Greens who are pretty anti roads. But, you know, what do you know? The roads are still actually going. Um, and, well, you know, they are. Yeah. They're still building roads. So, you know, but Labor w- wouldn't want to take credit for that. They just don't want to take... Um, the crap that would come their way if they stopped it. And, and, and the same, exactly what you said with the working families. And, you know, like the national opposed it, but now it's there, I'll oh, move on, next issue. So, you know, maybe over over time, you have a bit of that, bit of that, bit of this, bit of that, and, you know, that's what New Zealand wants. Do you think that, and, I, and I've said this example a couple of times on this podcast, so I apologise to people who regularly listen or watch. Um, I remember specifically when Don Brash was running with as the leader of the National Party, talking about who he could form a coalition with, and he stated publicly he could work with any party except for Labour. And as a, as a voter, I kind of went, well, I, I understand the politics of that, but actually what I want is the best functioning government for for me as a citizen. And it was a bit disappointing to hear him rule out, you know, 40% of the MPs immediately that he couldn't work with. I was, and I was thinking about this current COVID situation would have been the perfect time, is the perfect time for somehow these two parties to come together and work together. But it's still, I don't know, it doesn't seem possible. It certainly hasn't happened. And now that we're kind of through the worst of it, it's turning into a, you know, a bun fight, again, if that is the correct term. Do you think that there is actually any any way that, that the two main parties in New Zealand can work together, kind of, forget the conscience vote, I mean actually on policy, on anything? Um, well, I think you've seen them work together on the uh, climate change policy. Right. That, um, sure, has um, brought in. And, you know, that's one area, because, you know, I could level that same criticism against the Greens. We'll work with anybody but national sort of thing, yeah. which wasn't quite what they said. What they said is, we'll work with anybody, but we'll only go into coalition. We wouldn't go into coalition with national, was actually what they, they say. But so I think I think there are issues where they do come together, but they do tend to be by far the exception. No, that's 10% maybe, and yeah. the other 90 and in, in so far as now they're at each other's faces, that's because there's an election around the corner. And so they're, they're yeah. positioning. Um, so, yeah, exciting times. Interesting hearing that thing about the Greens and, and National. And I've, I've heard or read a couple of times um, Todd Muller talk very highly of James Shaw, actually, say that they work together on it. So maybe that's a, that's a Green Party, National Party of yesteryear. Maybe they could work together in a more official way today. I, I don't know. Well, the, the only issue for the Greens is they're not just a Green Party, of course. The, you know, Marama um, Davidson represents, you know, the social, um, de- she called it Social Democrat, I guess, side. And they're, they're very anti-national. Um, and that's always been the Green, you know, the Greens itself yeah. is a bit of a coalition between those two groups. And um, when they try to go all Green, all hell breaks loose within their ranks. So, you know, um, it's limited how much they can work with natural. But I thought what James did with this um, climate change policy of getting an agreement was bloody awesome. Because that, get that, that out of the mess is not easy. That climate change, uh, you, um, I was going to say an early adopter, it's the wrong word, but, you know, when uh, there's some very loud voices in New Zealand were coming out talking against climate change, and I'm thinking of 
um, my former, co- former co- colleague Leighton Smith and I'm thinking of Ian Wishart and these kinds of people, y- you stepped up and wrote a book explaining what it was. You were very much in the in the camp of, guys, we need to pay attention to this. And in fact, I can probably show you this. I've got a little trick I can do with my Zoom. Uh, if I do this, I can show you a little photo that you've got up on your uh, Facebook page, which is which is pretty cool, actually, um, of you off your Facebook page standing on, it looks to me like ice or salt or or somewhere, but, you know, referencing climate change, referencing Kiribati as well. So um, people who are listening won't see this, but um, it's it's a passion of yours. It's something that you think is vital and important to, to sort out. Oh, totally. It, you know, apart from the virus at the moment, it's by far the biggest issue is climate. And the whole point of the book that we did on, climate called Poles Apart was to address the wish arts of the Latin Smiths who seemed to me to be, you know, religious fanatics when it came to this, um, this issue and, you know, didn't have a skerrick of, you know, evidence-based um, uh, justification. So um, I got together with John McChrystal and, I mean, our, at the time I was very ambivalent about the whole thing, I have to say. Um, I just agreed with whatever the latest article was I read on climate change for or against. Right. Um, so what we did is, and, you know, this is a virtue of the fact that, I, you know, I had a reasonable amount of money by then, is we just hired the best people in the world on both sides and we set them, scientists, and we set them against each other. And we sat there, John and I, as basically the judge and jury. Yep. And we kept... Um, so we'd filter both arguments, then send them back to the other camp and they'd come back. And we kept going until both sides were out on the floor, essentially. And then we um, wrote it up, just like a judge and jury um, would do. And the conclusion we got um, at t- to at the end of that was on the balance of evidence, there's no dispute that the world world average temperature is rising. That's not a, that no, neither side's disputing that. Yeah. One says it's a natural phenomena, the other says it's anthropogenic. And we said, we concluded at the end of the day on the balance of evidence, um, it's anthropogenic. You couldn't say without absolute doubt at that stage it's anthropogenic, you know, because without any doubt, that's what people get hung for that sort of, you know, um, firm conclusion. But you would be very stretched to hold an argument, um, evidence-based arguments that it wasn't. And, and that's where we got to really on that. And of course, that's 10 years ago now. And um, things have moved on and all the charts have gone a hell of a lot faster now. And we're not talking about two degrees warming now um, with business as usual. We're talking about four. And four is a, an absolute disaster. And that's what the um, IPCC next year will be including in its base case will be 3.6 to 4 degrees is wow. where we're heading. So, you know, this is serious shit. This is really serious, um, this stuff. Um, so I get very angry with people like Leighton Smith and I, I just find them idiots, basically. And we need to just dismiss that. And I, I was um, I was up in Central Otago on the weekend, up in Naseby to do the uh, night sky tour. It was amazing. Um, and I noticed, you know, we're coming out of autumn, we're in winter, but how brown it was up there already from the dryness. And I, as you say, four degrees, my head straight away goes to, Imagine Central's average temperature going up by four degrees. You've basically got a desert then. I mean, it's, there's nothing left. So. Yeah, well, the biggest effects, of course, are um, things like storms, um, you know, extreme weather events is, is what is where you get the event. And, you know, now I'm sort of running a golf course, you know, water matters because you need water for your greens. And, um, I mean, we were struggling this year, and the people in Auckland, of course, had a hell of a bigger um, drought that we've had down in Wellington, and they're still bloody struggling. Um, so, you know, life changes, and people might say, oh, we could do without a golf. But it's a lot of uses of water, hell of a lot of uses. And so it's, you know, it's pretty serious stuff. And I think the main it, the main tragedies will be, of course, in those countries in the tropics who, you know, depend on water for their once a year, you know, crop to break the droughts. Yeah. And they're the poorest people in the world, and they, they will bear by far the highest human cost because those of us that are in rich countries like this, we can afford adaptation techniques. You know, you can afford to but slowly, but move your house from the coast up a hill a bit. Yeah. You know, I mean, shivers they can't. Um, so yeah, it's not a very good legacy to be leaving to our children and grandchildren. And I wonder if, 
you know, there was all that talk when we were in lockdown about how the world was taking a break for a month. And, you know, there were the, the stories about dolphins and the and the Vienna can, uh, canals and, you know, being able to see uh, Everest from a place in India, which you couldn't see for 80 years. Um, and people were talking about maybe this will help, maybe this will set back the clock a bit. But it seems we've just gone straight back into it. And now I wonder if the virus, A, has taken focus away from the climate change question, but B, will drive resources away from that as well. And if the, the sum total is going to be the virus really harming the climate change conversation long term. Yeah, and then there's a counter argument that the virus is actually climate change's biggest ally because it'll bring to the bring to an end big carbon footprint activities like tourism, right? Um, travel generally. So you know, there's a bit of yin and yang, um, yang here. But I I agree with you. You know, whereas the world, I know it's been very imperfect, but the world has reacted. You know. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Almost uniform, not uniformly, but all together against the virus. They don't do anything like that against climate change. I mean, we were in Russia just before the um, before COVID broke out, and we were in Irkutsk, um, which is um, on Lake Baikal. And I must, I, I'll never forget this. I was standing on a bridge over a rail yard as we were walking from one side of town to the other, and I just stood there transport every ten minutes. A train would come through with 30 carriages full of coal. Wow. You know, and they were taking the coal from the centre of Russia, or the, was the, basically it's the, um, whereas it's the west of Siberia. They were taking it to Vladivostok for export. And I thought, there's little old New Zealand, you know, <laughs> down the end of the world, if they could just see what's in front of us now, you know, in terms of the commitment to fossil fuels, you'd realise what a huge mountain we have to climb here. Do you know in New Zealand, because I always think about New Zealand, I always think about hydropower and thermal, geothermal power. Do you know off the top of your head how much we're still burning fossil fuels for our power versus the renewable um, sources? I, I mean, the figure that just comes out of, I don't know where it's coming from, but um, I seem to recall is that we're 80% um, renewables. All right. Um, and, which will be mainly hydro. And so at the margin, we'll be burning gas and um, whatever. Um, before that so whereas the world you know is still something like 40 percent coal wow 50, you know, even even higher in europe um and so for some of those countries you know they they talk about this and they say well our only alternative is to go to nuclear no bloody way wind or solar is going to solve our energy needs and then you say or you can become less energy intensive yeah of course you know change your and that's you know, that's what I think is a wee bit interesting about that level four lockdown is that people suddenly weren't allowed to travel, weren't allowed the big carbon footprints. And in New Zealand anyway, they said, oh, life's not so bad. Now, of course, we were running on empty, you know, in the sense that we um, we can get by a month or two without generating income before, you know, too many people lose their jobs. So it's not a permanent state. And people, I know those conversations when you'd be walking around your neighbourhood, people would say to you, you know, God, if we could only do this all the time, wouldn't life yeah. be bloody awesome? <laughs> yeah. You know? But um, that transition from a carbon economy to, you know, a carbon extensive economy is still all in front of us, I'm afraid. Yeah, I'd, it's funny when people say, I wish we could do this all the time. You kind of can. And I was wondering out of the lockdown if things like uh, remote working, you know, we've always said, oh, we can work from home in this technology, we've got, but we've never done it. But now maybe people have have experienced that they then start to choose to do it. And, and coming out of lockdown, we're, we're being, we've been forced into looking to alternatives to how we run our lives. And if we choose to, some of those alternatives can fairly easily stay. But also that firms as well will, I think, be looking at that and saying, sure, as you know, we can get our overhead down here. Yeah. If, uh, you know, half our workforce can work from home and they bear the overhead of housing themselves. And, all, you know, that's just what we need to maintain profits in a world where, you know, revenue is not climbing as fast because, um, you know, the COVID effect on the whole economy. So, you know, I mean, we can be optimistic that it will accelerate some changes. 
um, I think. And the longer it goes on, the more that will be the case. Yeah, and I mean, I, I mean, I, I think about media and I think about you know, radio and stuff because it's what my background is. And you know, during COVID, I, I built a little studio, and that was my thing. And so now I think about, um, I think about you know, NZME or Media Works having a ten million dollar business in central Auckland or whatever, a building, you know, you can, far, like America does, you can farm out your studios all over the country, all over the world. As you say, you don't have that overhead. And I'm sure places like MediaWorks right now would love that, MediaWorks in particular, to not have those extra yeah. overheads if they didn't have to. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, yeah, I think there will be changes, but I, it, it won't just be the householders deciding it, but the firms themselves will, will reconfigure it. Yeah. They have to because yeah. they don't have the revenue flow they had. And well, they don't want their share price crashing and you know potentially going out of business. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they have to adapt to the new environment. Well, and also if if as you say, I mean, you say two or three years this COVID thing. That's a terrifying thought. I've kind of set up at home. I had a studio in Central Dunedin, but I've chosen to move move it all home, mostly because I'm thinking, oh, you know, a year, eighteen months. Uh, that's the other thing. If 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 this COVID gets a second wave or a second strand or it comes back next winter or whatever, all those restrictions on those uh, media outlets will happen again. It's like well, future proof yourself now. It doesn't, for a, I put this carefully because I know some people out there are struggling financially, but for a media company, it's not expensive to set up a little, you know, studio in someone's house compared to a massive studio in a, you know, purpose built building sort of thing. It's not an expensive operation. So. And I think for a lot of firms that they can set up cheaper alternatives. You don't have to fly Wellington to Auckland to go and talk to somebody for an hour and fly back. I mean, how ridiculous yeah. it really is. <laughs> you know, it's just nuts. I mean, we're talking on Zoom. You know, There could be six of us having this conversation. In fact, I think my wife's upstairs on Zoom with her book club, so there will be six or ten of them. Oh, people nice. On the, they're all sitting in their houses. Not because they're not allowed to move, but because... Um, it's actually more convenient. Yeah. You know, they don't waste time traveling across town to each other. Yeah. So, and in, and then the think, me, in the media, that's the that's the model they're using internationally. I mean, if you look at any decent sized radio host in America, they've got their studio in their house. They don't travel into a into a place and then they just the radio station just dials in. That that's what they do. They operate out of home. So Yeah. Yeah. Do you think um that with what we've come through now putting your economist's hat on do you think that we're going to come out of this, us being the country, financially okay? Is it going to be an uphill struggle? Um, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm not optimistic, actually, for New Zealand, um, unfortunately, and that is because we have so many bets on tourism and immigration as um, the engine rooms, you know. Obviously, we've got food and yeah, yeah. international trade and food and, and as long as the salmon story about COVID is not true. <laughs> I mean, if that's the case, then it can be carried on frozen food. You might as well go and shoot yourself now. Um, <laughs> no, assuming that's not the case, and it is a person-to-person -person thing, then that does not augur well for um, tourism, um, I, I don't think. And so that, that's a big restructuring that's needed. There's a lot of people employed in New Zealand and tourism or tourism related activities. Mum and dads with dairies, you know, in yep. Queenstown or, you know, on the way to Queenstown, whatever it is. So yeah, that that to me is that's a hell of a leg on um to be expecting a, a good recovery on the back. So um I think you'll see the general level of activity come off quite a bit and um I would expect, you know, just rule of thumb for me. I'd expect um, unemployment levels to get up over 10, in that 10 to 15 percent, um, as we go through the restructuring. As we as we think about, you know, three four percent unemployment being a, a pretty good rate, coming out of this at 10 to 15, would that still be? And when I say a good result, obviously I don't mean good, but I mean compared, like America was talking about a 20 25 percent unemployment rate at one stage, would 10 to 15 be okay, or do you think it could have been lower? Some decisions were taken out of that out of that um, bad decision column, or or is that a fair result for what we've gone through? Um, I mean, I'm using ten to fifteen as indicative. I mean, the reality may well be that there's a hell of a lot of underemployment. Right. So yeah. yes, you're working from home, but actually you're only now getting paid the equivalent of you know whatever twenty five hours a week 
or whatever. So it won't necessarily show up purely in the um, unemployment number because I would regard myself as still employed yeah. you know, 25 hours a week, but I'm well below um, where I'd like to be in terms of what I thought I was going to be um, getting. So where we'll really see it is in household incomes and their spending um, and basically GDP because that's the aggregate measure of income at the end of the day. So, yeah, I mean, and all the economists in New Zealand are saying this really, that you can expect probably the biggest recession we've had in the modern era um, from this, um, starting this next quarter, this June quarter. I like, um, you said something about the uh, social contract that we've got kind of with politicians and the government. I like the idea of the, the, the contract, the idea of a, we've made a deal. I've been talking a little bit about that with the media during this lockdown, you know, and how the media is having to change their model now because advertising is drying up, their bottom dollar. And I've been saying, you know, as consumers of media, we've been saying, okay, you set the rules, media, which were I get to listen or watch, you bung a bunch of adverts in front of me. I accepted those rules. Now that that rules don't work anymore, you want to change the contract. So it's a similar sort of thing, and I've just because you kind of explained our relationship to politics or the government, similar to what I've been thinking about media, it just makes me think there must be so much in life if we stopped and thought that we have sort of a contract or an agreement with an entity, and how much of those agreements, you know, whatever it is, whether it's with your kids' school, there's agreement that how how we operate together is what we do with our children that are and have changed through this period as well, and actually. It actually makes me think this isn't this is maybe even a bigger change than I've been thinking about. There's going to be a huge yeah, amount of change uh, out the back of this. That would be sport. I mean, think about the relationship with sport that they suddenly turn that off. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of us said, well, actually, I didn't realise I could get through the week without the sport. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a bit of a shock to my system. Um, now the sports come back on of a fashion, and, and that's that's great. But, you know, you can forget international sport. Yeah. Just true and difficult. I mean, look at the tennis now in New York playing without a crowd and, you know, so on. It won't be the same. So I, I think there'll be a lot of changes. But there will be substitutes, you know, and that if you're in business, that's what you're looking for. Where Where's that consumer demand? I know it's going to be down in aggregate, but where is the demand that's there? Where it's, is it going to point to? And I know my own family, I'm talking about my kids and their kids, is that they were surprised how well the distance learning for even primary school kids went during the lockdown and that they'd be at home, but their teacher would contact them, you know, through the um, Zoom or whatever, um, twice a week for homework and so on. So, you know, some amalgam of that model and the old conventional one of, you know, nine to three every single day yeah. um, at school could well be where we head to as a result of this. Um, you know, it sort of fits with mum and dad working at home. And mum and dad working at home, by the way, boy, does that get your overheads down. You know, because the cost of going to work is a big part of your wages. So if you want your wages to go further, keep doing what you're doing. Keep your home studio. Keep, you know, yeah. your half home schooling, whatever. Um, it saves on the childcare, da da da. So I think we will become, that's called adaptation you know, to permanently lower income. And I think it just takes time for people to get into the new norm. So, so when I hear you speaking, I think about how you've described adaptation as it's when we have a choice to change back to the way we did, but we choose not to. That's the yeah. that's the adaptation. You say um, the travel thing is interesting because obviously living in Dunedin, everything's pretty close. So I typically I've got a revolting gas guzzler. It's it's it uses too much fuel, but I typically fill up once every two weeks because that's just because it's a small town. That's what we. Are. I didn't fill up for. I filled up the week that we went into lockdown, and then I think I filled up seven weeks later. So so I imagine that for someone who was in you know one of the major metros. Um, doing a tank a week or a tank every four days, that would be significant, not not you know, during lockdown, how much money that would have saved. So all I'm trying to say is that your quality of life won't necessarily go down if you lose a third of your income. Yeah. Or a quarter, say. Yeah. I mean, obviously at some point you get, you, pour, you pass the point of adaptation. <laughs> which, what else can I do? You know, I'm stuck sort of thing. But I think there's, there, there is headroom there for not all New Zealanders, 
But a lot of New Zealanders just say, well, if I didn't do this, didn't do that, if I didn't drive my gas guzzler, yeah. it's not about the carbon so much. In that case, it's shit, I can, I can use that money for, you know, to do this, which is equally fun. Yeah. So there's a there's a movie that I think about a lot called This Is 40. It's a Judd Apatow movie. And the storyline for This Is 40 is um, Paul Rudd plays a record executive who started up his own company. And so he, and one of the things he's trying to do is he's trying to relaunch all the old rockers from the 70s. You know, that's what he's into. And he launches this one uh, artist, uh, does a new album for him, and finances are tight, and the company needs this album to hit and go big. And it doesn't. It doesn't hardly sell at all. And the artist says to Paul Rudd's character, oh, did you expect this to sell? And Paul Rudd's character is like, oh, of course, we need this to sell. And then the lesson in this and the way that the artist words it is, you need to learn to keep your nuts small. You know, you keep your outgoings down, and then you can keep your... And, and I, I actually think about that a lot, like that, that scene with my life. <laughs> I think about that a lot. And probably once a fortnight, once a month, I'll be in a conversation talking about keeping my nuts small. I have to make sure that I explain what I'm talking about or they think the conversation is completely different. But when you're related to finances, it, it kind of makes, which is what you're saying, it, it makes a lot of sense. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've seen people, you know, with very high incomes, but also even higher expenditures, and you get a little economic downturn and, oh, geez, it's a bloody disaster. You know, and then I've seen other people with far lower incomes, but with the expenditures just a bit less, and they've been able to absorb it, no problem. So, you know, it's not a function of income. Yeah. It's a function of the difference between the two, isn't it? Yeah. I remember my uh, one of my sisters, uh, I'm the youngest of four, I've got three older sisters, and she was earning well. She was working in accounts for various companies. I was a student working part-time, you know, making in the 90s, 200 bucks a week sort of thing. And she taught me a pretty good lesson when she pointed out that I had more expendable cash than she did. And, and she wasn't an extravagant spender, but just because she had a house and she had insurances and her overheads left her with yeah. less money at the end of the week than, than me as a student who was basically working in a petrol station for beer and gas money. You know, that was all I wanted. So, yeah. Speaking of uh, speaking of kind of uh, spending money and stuff, I'm really interested to know a bit more. What am I trying to do about about this place? I this is for people who are listening we're looking at uh the Morgan's golf course and I like this line off the front page which says uh while privately owned and managed for the owner's personal enjoyment uh green fiend players are most welcome tell me about this how do you go into you know buying a golf course that's that sounds super super exciting well, I was looking for a house on a golf course and couldn't find one, so I thought both of them. I'm probably going to leave that. Don't, don't, don't believe a word of it. Um, what happened was I was a member of that club, and I, you know, I'm a bit of a hacker. I am certainly wouldn't call myself a golfer. But I was a member out there, and unfortunately, and I first played there actually in the early 70s when the course had only just been built. Right. So I sort of go back to that course. I hadn't been there continuously, but... We went back to it a few years ago, about three or four years ago, and it was very obvious that the club was in big trouble. It's one of those country clubs that, in the old days, you know, it had three or four hundred members, and it made most of its money across the bar, right? Um, because people, you know, drink themselves stupid and then drive <laughs> home. But as that model sort of fell away in terms of legality, um, it suffered, and I think in the end it got down to about sixty members. And you just can't wash your face at that. So they uh, they had to sack the greenkeeper. They had some old guys, you know, run, um, driving the mowers. They couldn't afford to sharpen the blades. They were pulling out more glass than they were cutting. Oh, it was just, just not good. <coughs> so in the end, they um, went bust, basically. Right. Um, and so it came down to what's going to happen to the course. And I just was out there one day and I just thought, I don't know what I'll do. I'll buy it. <laughs> So um, I did. And then I got home and my wife said, what did you do that for? <laughs> and I, I actually don't know, Joanne, but I'll think of a reason. Just give me just give me some time. Um, I just like, like being out there because it's lovely in a valley and it's a nice country course. And then I really got stupid and bought the farm and the forest next door. So now we've got a huge little place um, out there. And we've got the – we've hired green keepers – so the course is coming back really nicely. And then next door on the farm, we're going to put a whole lot of cycleways. And so I've decided it's going to be my 
it's going to be a legacy. Right, I'm nice. going to just do this for fun. I'm at that stage of life that, you know, where I need to really, I'm counting the years here. Um, <laughs> I need to, you know, make sure I'm having a lot of fun. And there's a lot of projects out there in terms of the cycleways. It all, it'll all link into Battle Hill, which is a big regional park cycle um, park. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And it's right down the middle of it goes that infamous transmission gully. All oh, right. Um, road. So it's going to be right on Highway 1 um, whenever that actually happens. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 and it's such a difference. It's such a difference to you know doing business or doing policy or riding motorcycles around the world. It's just another chapter, you know. And as long as it keeps me out of jail, I'm happy. I've got a question that I've always, always, always wanted to ask you in particular. Might not be an appropriate question. I don't know, but I've always wanted to know how logistically you give away forty-seven million dollars. Uh, it's really difficult. Yeah, yeah, because I, okay. I was thinking, do you do a trust? Do you have a board to decide? What's the, the logistics behind going, my son did trade me, my cut's $47 million. I don't really need it, want it, um, I'm going to give it away. How, how, do, how does that even, how does it happen logistically? That's what I've always wanted to know. Yeah, well, when I started on it, I thought, well, it's actually pretty hard. Why don't I just put it all in a helicopter and fly over the world or somewhere <laughs> it out you know at least it's over and um i can save myself the grief and then i thought well the real issue here is that there's a whole lot of causes and they're all you know, let's assume they're all totally admirable you yeah. know they're all fantastic they might all have differing abilities in terms of executing and you know getting value for money out of each but everybody's heart in these areas is in the right place how the hell do i choose between the different things you know and I, I tried different models and none of them really worked any better than they did in business so in the end i thought well i've got to have fun yeah i've got to have fun doing it so that's why i linked up with unicef and we did a lot with unicef in these countries around the world which so happened to fit with my motorcycle ambition <laughs> so we were riding around the world and then we'd go and do a couple of projects in, you know, Paraguay or wherever it was. And it sort of opened up to me a whole new range of experiences about how people struggle and live in, in, other, in other parts of the world. And I found that really rewarding to be able to go there, see it for myself and make a small, you know, contribution. And we've done a lot of that over the years. And th so that was the first stream. And then the second stream was um, just conservation. And I got pretty hooked on conservation in New Zealand. Still am, actually, um, doing quite a lot in that area still. And, um, you know, some of it's sort of a semi-policy area um, with predator-free New Zealand. Yep. God, we were stoked when we were so stoked when John Key um, said that was a goal, predator-free 2050. Man, suddenly we weren't loonies out there on, you know, on bikes with cycle, cycle clips anymore. We were mainstream, you know, really awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, so that's been a lot of fun doing the predator free work. And, and so it's been, a, what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is it's been an evolution. It started off with, well, let's get rid of it. We don't need it. And then, oh, God, how the hell do you do this? Yeah. You know, and it's been quite a long, you know, pathway. As we, and we're still doing it. And our son, Sam, does a lot too. And he's far more efficient, of course, than I am. He's got business models left, right and centre. And, you know, he's he's having a lot of fun, though. I think overseas doing what he does. I'm sure he's developed an app on how to give money away or something like that, and it's much more efficient. The whole team, you know. <laughs> so of that of that money from Trade Me, um, again, uh, I don't want to delve into any of your financial business, but is that is that still ha like is there still there is there still stuff receiving from that today, or is it is it all been done with? Oh no no, um, it's it's well over halfway that that particular money, but um, no, no, I'm still doing it. <coughs> because you know i just enjoy it so i wait for things that are going to give me a buzz and i say yeah, right. we'll step up for that that's very cool hey um gareth uh, i think i think we're going to uh, have to let you go i keep talking to you for another hour but it's um it's uh you're a busy man what what it was with all the all, all the, the hats you've worn over the years someone said to you today what do you do for a job gareth like if they didn't know who you were or what you did what what's your response today well, I think, you know, I'm retired basically these days. Um, 
but I mean, I was obviously trained as an economist. That's that was my first love, and it still is. I love economics. And then I took that through a series of businesses. I had Infometrics. I started that, which was a pure economic consultancy. And then we did Gareth Morgan Investments, which was a fund manager that we sold to Kiwi Bank. Mm -hmm. Actually, made a lot more out of that than I did out of trading, <laughs> by the way. Anyway, let's not stop there. Trading, of course, was a lot of fun. And there's been a couple of instances after that as well. So I've done, I've done a lot of stuff, I think, over the world. But in terms of the activity that I've had the biggest buzz out of, probably just riding my motorcycle around the world. I mean, that, in terms of being educated and being, you know, you're up in a plane in Tibet and you're <clears throat> sitting with a family in their yurt <clears throat> drinking their god-awful yak tea yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you're swapping photos of your family and, and theirs all around. You're having great fun and then you go out and push the electric start on your motor and go to a different um, planet. And have you got any any of those? I mean, obviously, it's 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 a weird world we're living in with lockdowns and that. But are there already plans in the future for the next trip where you're going with your bike the next time? Well, we were we had one big trip left to do, and we were going to ride from Mar Mauritania, which is just south of Morocco, right. um, ride around west um, West Africa, and then come down into Angola and across Zimbabwe and into Mozambique. So that was the the last um, that was our I was calling it last legs. But unfortunately, that's been um, stifled for the moment. So I'm I'm sitting here with bated breath. I might be too old by the time I'm allowed to do that. Has anyone we'll has anyone ever taken a motorbike across Antarctica out of interest? Well, we had motorbikes down there, yeah, but not across. Not across. I think somebody has actually. I think they went down that road from McMurdo. There's an ice road down to the South Pole. I don't know if they've gone right across, but I think they went down that. I think it was an American did it. Um, yeah. Because I asked to do it, and the Americans said to me at the time, if anybody's going to do that, son, it's going to be an American. <laughs> first to the moon, first across Antarctica on a bike. We did North Korea. We went right across North Korea and through the DMZ. No one's done that before or since, so I've got that feather still. You seem to have done so much. Um, I think the, the, the country, if not the world, deserves a, like a series of memoirs out of you. When are they coming? Well... I went, I've been through my book phase. We actually wrote 13 books in five years. Um, six of them travel books and the rest serious books. So I'm sort of in recovery mode at the moment. <laughs> so it's, it's nowhere in sight right now. I'm, I'm, I'm too busy playing around on the farm and the golf course. That's great. <laughs> hey, Gareth, thank you for um, giving us a whole bunch of your time, your valuable time this morning. It's been great fun. I've always wanted to talk to you. So often when you work in media and work in radio and stuff, you do touch base with people a lot, but I've never connected with you. So I really appreciated that you uh, were wanting to give up a bit of time, come and have a chat with us here on the uh, on the crazy little podcast thing that we do, because it's been a whole lot of fun. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, mate. Pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Ciao.